So then we already mentioned the corset, but in particular, this corset is from um, Red Threaded. Um, and we we really, it's really comfortable. I love the way it fits me. Um, and it does kind of give us a little bit of a window into, you know, relative wealth. Um, some people could argue, so so when this, this corset is marketed on their website as being 1860s, um, and it does have gores in the bust. But if you look at, um, is her name Janet Arnold or, oh gosh. It's Janet, Janet Arnold, yeah. Janet Arnold's um, book, she has an 1871, 1872 um, garment that if I'd had a little bit more time and confidence, I maybe would have tried to recreate that garment, and maybe I will. Um, it's great because it's a skirt, an overskirt, and then three different bodices. So the mm -hmm. idea is that at the time, people were really starting to think more about like, how can I make sure that I can wear this thing you know, as much as possible? And um, she she does point out um, in that particular garment that that would have been worn with a gourd corset as well. Um, so we could we could either argue either, you know, Polly is either choosing to keep an, an 1860s shape because she feels it's very comfortable on her. Um, as again, not not without knowing her exact body type, um, this kind of corset is extra extra comfortable on people who are short waisted, um, which I am. And I I also just like I love the way it fits and feels on me. Um, I don't think an 1880s corset would be torture, but the 1860s is definitely way more comfortable. And you could argue that you know she was in her 50s. Um, in the 1870s, and so she probably would have stuck to something that was comfortable for her and that she was used to, but uh, maybe wouldn't be the absolute, absolute brand new, you know, style of corset that the young 20 year old girls are wearing. Well, and, and we see in our own in our own lives and also in other other situations that people do tend to kind of stick to the clothes they're comfortable with, at least as far as undergarments and cut. That from their 30s and 40s um, for, the, for the rest of their lives. And, um, and also we have text evidence of that. Um, we have specifically also people like, especially the first major shift in stays that happened in the 18th century, we have older women complaining that they don't like the new silhouette, that they've lost their pockets. They think it looks bad on most people. And it's exactly how I feel when I see um, the way that trousers are cut now where they go really far into the person's um butt crack and I'm like that can't be on purpose that literally doesn't fit called a wedgie. it's literally called a wedgie. yeah we, in, in, yeah mm -hmm. when we were in high school that was embarrassing and you didn't want that to happen and now apparently that's how it's supposed to sit on your body and it makes me feel very elderly because I'm like, oh, that's you, my per No, 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 you can't do these that. days. Sure. My goodness. People can't uh -huh. say that you have a butt crack. How horrible. You know, it's just like, right. obviously, I, obviously, I, even though everybody has a butt crack, that shouldn't be visible, you know. So it's just a little, you know, and it's becoming something that's marking us as older is that we just, we find that weird and we don't like it. And um, so similarly, uh, but also the, the other big difference between that corset and the slightly earlier style that we have for the other garments we're using is that it does have an opening bust, mm -hmm. and um, and it it's uh, that's the main thing is it's an opening bust. It's easier to get in and in and out of basically. <laughs> okay. I need to go take a break. Could you talk about the core system more while I'm running upstairs? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, so basically, the uh, the other reason that we wanted to highlight the course that is it is um, off the rack. It is from uh, Red Threaded. Um, which is a company in Colorado that we really admire and, and have a lot of things from. But as Laura said, it is a big part of interrogating privilege because to have a well-fitted, well-made corset now as in then, while then they were more ubiquitous and probably cheaper from a perspective of, you know, your mental budget there on what your, what your clothing should cost, um, it still did take a certain level of privilege to um, have uh, care for and to properly wear um, a corset. And that's part of why when you're looking at images of women from the 1870s um, and you've learned to train your eye to whether or not they have a corset on, which is almost always in a photograph, because again, it's their very best outfit. Um, the stays and or a corset are very, uh, both integral to how women presented themselves at the time, but also a really important part of, you know, thinking about privilege in modern costuming, because for a lot of people getting the corset or getting a corset that fits correctly 
is a really important um, uh, speed bump. I won't say barrier because you can do it and you can do it yourself. Um, we can also share some resources and do a specific conversation about those resources. But um, bottom line is in generally, if you're wearing your modern undergarments, you're just not gonna get the silhouette that you're going for, for these earlier eras, um, unless you're doing a very specific kind of garment where women were making a point of not wearing a corset, uh, which was a thing. But uh, for one of the reasons that we decided to build poly, this 1870s impression of poly around a corset is, is that, you know, all of our research led us to the unavoidable conclusion that she would have done her best to look from the outside as fashionable as any other woman of her of her class in, in the United States and nearby. Technically, any country and Cherokee Nation was not the United States, part of the problem <laughs> that we had later. But, um, but it, it does appear that she would have wanted to project herself that way. And as far as we can tell, she definitely had the means to do so. And access to trade routes and traders and merchants in order to make those desires a reality. Um, so I'm, that is a lot of, of course, it's, uh, we can switch back to, let's talk about the rest of the, of the layers. Okay. Um, and we do, have, what do you want to tell us about the corset cover? Well, the corset cover was really exciting for me because um, it was kind of, it was the first thing that I made um, for this get up. Um, so, well, um, like I was very fortunate that Lisa already had a lot of the other foundation garments. So that saved me a lot of time and, and frankly money and, and, and trouble. Um, but so this was kind of the first thing that I really made. And I was really excited um, with how it came out. And part of why it came out is, I mean, it is, it is a really solid um, pattern. It's laughing moon. Um, uh, and it has the pattern already has a lot of other options that I'm probably gonna end up using at some point. Um, but another thing that we did was we did do kind of a quick um, fitting where I had kind of a, a muslin version um, and, you know, Lisa re, re set for me one of the, the darts. I think it would have been just fine, just right out of the package. I think I even, I put photos on Instagram of what it looked like and I was really happy with it. But then, you know, having that, that change, the changes that we made did, did bring it even more into focus, which was kind of nice. It was also, this is, this is a totally random sewing note, but it was also my first time um, not using a fusible interfacing. Um, and again, I could have gotten away with it. I mean, it isn't that I'm, I've done everything completely historically accurately. I, I have used a serger a lot in this project um, for finishing my seams, you know, more quickly. Um, but it, it was, it was really, it was really interesting to, to, to try to really see, okay, what happens if I, if I try to stick to something that's a little bit more likely. Um, Again, except for the surging. Um, so I think, you know, in, in real life, uh, since a corset cover is is washed a lot, um, it probably would have been finished with French seams um, or felled seams. Um, but I just did um, surging um, of all the seams and then uh, press them open so that they would be nice and and flat. Um, and I, I'm really I'm really happy with it. And the, the main machine that I have used um, for Actually, so besides the serger, the, the machine I used most for this project was my 1952 Singer, which, you know, obviously is a little bit of time travel. Um, although sewing machines did exist at this time, but they, they were using a chain stitch instead of a lock stitch. Um, and I, I even looked up, like when I used my attachments, I used a rolled hem foot um, and I also used a ruffler. And from what I can tell, the hemming foot I think that you'd be much more on solid ground using those if you were closer to the 1890s. Um, but those were two of the first kinds of attachments that were ever devised. Um, that was my understanding is that those were some of the very first. And actually it was Marna Jean's work that emboldened me to tell you, yes, you can use a machine for almost everything because she makes a very strong argument from, again, her examination of extants that very early you see things that are fully everything is machine sewn even the hem even things that now for like couture you wouldn't mm -hmm. you would use a, a hand stitch so that it would be invisible like they they apparently did not care <laughs> was, they, they had a lot of garments to make they had to do it mostly themselves at home for these kinds of these kinds of um you know non-couture like home 
dresses. Um, they, they had a lot of people to put clothes on their backs and they weren't messing around. So you see these fully machine sewn, um, a lot of the techniques that we still use today were developed in that era. And the nice thing about the Victorian era is that you get, for the first time, because it was a new technology, you get all these great books and manuals about it. Whereas before for hand sewing, there can be areas where like we have to really look and examine and try and see, is that what it looks like? But they were telling, they were, they were teaching people how to do it from distance uh, because of the railroads, because of print media, because of the new availability of mail order that was part of the business model of getting people to use machines was making sure that they knew how much time they were gonna save, how much more stuff they could work with, how much nicer their clothes could be because they could have a skirt that used five yards of fabric and they weren't gonna have to hem, you know, five times 45 of hem. <laughs> they weren't gonna have to do that by hand. Especially, and I'll be, I'll say also as my personal observation, I've been working on this, um, the, uh, the tear dress version that uses a very commonly for the era, for the 1800th, 19th century, um, what we now call a quilting cotton, which is, a, which is also similar to the weight of fabric that you used. Mm -hmm. And we, I've been hand sewing that because it's an 1840s dress. I can do it. I'm a relatively experienced hand sewer. My hands are pretty like well-developed. I'm pretty comfortable with the kind of needle I like. But going from that dress to working on a 1830s mantua with silk brocade, silk thread, and silk sateen ribbon yesterday, just the level of ease I have in working through the, getting the needle punched through the fabric and pulled back out again with the thread is a hundred times easier than working with this tight, tight cotton with linen threads. And I can totally see why people so firmly embrace the machine because the machine punches through that fabric for you. It's doing that hard work for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, especially the very beginning of sewing machines, it was things like shoes and harnesses, things that are really hard for everyone to sew. But I can totally see why the sewing machine make how the sewing machine makes a cotton dress that uses so much fabric so much more accessible to everybody because I my hands get tired my arms get tired and um I recognize I'm not like a professional seamstress I've not been hand sewing for my entire life but like I can feel a difference in my body if I spent all if I spent six hours sewing on a cotton dress by hand versus six hours sewing on silk I don't I don't feel anything I'm not tired at all from six hours sewing on silk versus this cotton. So that's kind of my personal observation. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, I do wanna give um, some specific credence. One of the difficulties for us working in this era was that we're not deeply keyed into kind of the community that does this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to uh, acknowledge that the first person to, for both of us to get us into thinking we can do this was Madame Askew. And I was rushing to finish, there's actually a seam on your red petticoat that's inside out because I was rushing to finish it <laughs> before I was gonna see her. And I just couldn't, I couldn't unpick it. It's a silk cotton, very fine dot, like sheer fabric. It, I, I wasn't gonna unpick it. I was, it was like 10 at night. I did it wrong and I just kept going because it was underwear anyway. It was like the second petticoat. And Madame Askew encouraged me. I was like texting her in the middle of the night. What is this? What am I doing? Yeah, I'm freaking out. And because I was just, I just wanted, because I was going to see her at our launch event for Twins and Needles. And she was, she ended up draping a bodice onto me um, over that corset, over those petticoats. But she was our massive inspiration for the era. She made it approachable. She made it possible. And she really held my hand in the making of those first couple of petticoats. And she just brings such joy and, you know, life into the era. And, and she's, she, so I just want to acknowledge how, what an important inspiration and influence she was on me, even considering working in the 19th century. 
Um, and also say that part of that, part of what made me so comfortable with her is that we personally knew her since we were children. Yeah. Um, and so I knew that she also had in her heart a, a deep embracing of my same kind of anti-racist principles. I knew I wasn't going to find out in five years that she's, you know, casually racist or said something mean about, you know, a trans person, or I, I just knew that she embraced the same values that we have. And so that made me more comfortable to go, this is a person I can trust who, who can help me make these garments, but also shares my values. And that was one of our challenges when we first started looking at this era was, you know, we had the advantage of being able to read all these documents from the era but also when we had a modern question, we could ask Madame Askew. So do you want to talk a little bit more about her, her influence and the amazing work she did with us um, in our launch event? Well, I think, I think again, yeah, you're, you're mentioning that we, we did, did all know each other in high school. And so that, that it's, it's been really exciting to watch her, her life you know, progress in ways that none of us could have imagined. Um, and I think that also, yeah, like seeing her as like, you know, a person that we knew um, do do this kind of thing and like take it and make it instead of like staid and you know dull and stuffy making it really fun and having a lot of fun with it and also feeling uh, you know a deep deep connection to the kind of playfulness of it that I think is something that not everybody you know gets Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course she also is part of the steampunk community which i think is a community that does, tends to take itself a little bit less seriously because it's not you know real life but yeah. even so like she gave a great talk about you know this is what you know people were wearing underneath these clothes and this is why and um you know, and kind of this is how you can tell you can look at that garment from the outside and see that there's even though if you can't tell like the color of the petticoats Mm -hmm. You know, there's these various things have to be under there for this to be working this way. Yeah, so um, just, just explain that kind of stuff. And then also, um, yeah, I mean, there is there is always a danger of especially, you know, for the Civil War time. Um, I, when I was in grad school and even afterwards, I did quite a lot of photography projects about um, people who were kind of reenactors. Mm -hmm. There was always in some parts of the country, there were times when that was a little bit dicey. Yeah, um, had to be like not really sure why they are as into this as as they are, um, and having to be a little bit you know guarded about mm -hmm. my own feelings, um, and then also just accepting that like everybody approaches history in, in their own way, but also saying you know like we we can be excited about about clothing and about having fun and about telling stories. Um, while trying to also be, you know, honest with ourselves about the people in the past and and trying to see them as whole people mm -hmm. um, and not just, you know, a certain way. Like it, it, like here in Minnesota, in particular, there's a real amnesia um, around in 1862 that President Lincoln signed the largest mass execution order in the United States history ever to this day. It's never against been. against Indians. Yeah, yeah, against <laughs> Dakota and and in, in Mankato. Mm -hmm. And the, that the, I, I mean, like I was surprised to learn about it. And then I'm also always surprised when Minnesotans have never heard of it. Mm -hmm. No idea. They, they, they grew well, up. Like, even yeah. like, I'll, I'll mention to people from Texas, because they'll, they'll talk about, oh, we didn't really, you know, they, because they don't have like a Gettysburg equivalent, right? So mm -hmm. They, they'll they say, oh, we didn't hear a lot about that in school or I never thought about it. And I'll say, well, what was the Alamo about? Do you know what the Alamo was about? And they're like, freedom. I'm like, freedom to do what? Yeah. <laughs> freedom to do what? <laughs> exactly. Property exactly. rights. Which property? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> I turned into like the church lady from the 19, 1990s uh, SNL and I'm like, hmm, isn't that special? You know, <laughs> like, aren't yeah. you cute? <laughs> you know, like, so, so nobody, um, and, then, and then also, you know, we, we can't ignore the, um, you know, on top of everything else, um, one of the other wonderful things that, like, that I feel at Madame Askew, she hasn't done this for me personally, but it affects me personally, is really actively creating uh, safe spaces for queer voices. 
Um, and again, within the steampunk community, which is fine. Like I can take Polly and run right into steampunk. If yeah, I can. you could. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, and I think that's just, that's a really important part of when we talk about, um, my husband argues me against the word ethics, but when I talk about kind of the intersectionality, if you will, of doing costuming or costume study as a native person and realizing the reason people had 10 yards of cotton fabric to to sew with their sewing machines with their you know was also like the, it's chicken and egg the demand for the cotton fabric rose with various other um you know changes to technology but that but the sewing machine kind of put an extra piece of gas on that because you could make you know a 12 yard cotton dress and you could actually make it um in a reasonable amount of time by yourself or with a little help and um so there, there was chicken and egg, it kind of added to that and increased that, but also, you know, ultimately un until right before this period and arguably through this period in the 1870s, you still had people who were sharecropping, mm -hmm. um, who didn't have other skills, who ended up coming out of slavery, being freed, and then going right back to the same job and technically doing it for pay but not very good pay and not pay that got them generational wealth and so bearing in mind i was actually in a presentation yesterday um uh in um on 19th century clothing and the presenter to my to my happiness mentioned you can't have all this fabric without slavery mm -hmm. and it's a really important element to it which is um kind of recognizing that 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 it's a safe space we love to see people having safe spaces for you know, all kinds of people. We love to see inclusiveness. We love to see true intersectionality coming out of, of this community. And Madame Miskew was at least for us kind of the icon of that. And we had the good fortune to know her anyway. <laughs> but yeah. also she has a Patreon. So please like consider, you know, join her <laughs> Patreon. It's very fun. It's a very fun, lively. It's very Madame Miskew. Um, and she, uh, she was one of the presenters at our launch event and spent the entire weekend in character. <laughs> She's just got stamina. <laughs> like, 